spell it out. Now, something super, super important. Mother's Day. Mother's Day. Can we give a hand to all of our moms? So, I would like for you, if you happen to be uh, a mom, would you, would you please stand up at this time, please? I know if you're a mom, you're like really exhausted right now, probably. <laughs> Standing is you know, not, not something maybe you want to do, uh, but we would, we would like for all of, all of the moms to stand and, and so that we can recognize you and, uh, and say thank you to you so I can pray for you. Um, we love you. We love uh, who you are and uh, who you are to us. And so let me pray for you, and then, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll clap once again as you so deserve to be. I should receive. Father, thank you for um, the moms who are with us uh, today. Lord, thank you for those um, that you have called into this uh, just particular adventure, Lord. Lord, thank you that uh, you have equipped and given to all of our moms all that they need in you. Father, we're, we're thankful that being a mom does not fully define any woman here today, Lord. We know being a daughter of you is, is their greatest definition through Christ. And, and so I pray that they would uh, enjoy the identity they have as daughters first and foremost. And then, Father, I ask that you would fill them with your spirit, that you would allow them to operate under the righteousness that they have in Jesus, that you would fill their heads with the knowledge of their salvation in Jesus, and that you would fill their arms with the love that they have in Jesus. Lord, we're thankful for those that you have given to us, specifically even here at the Avenue Church. Thank you for those who mother here at the Avenue Church. We need them and we love them and we value them. So Lord, I pray that today, the moms who are here, the moms who are not, would feel a great sense of your favor, your love, your appreciation toward them. Father, I pray that you would comfort those who experience loss today, whether it be of their own mom, whether it be difficulty with a child, family situations, Lord. I pray that you would bring comfort where comfort is needed, blessing where blessing is needed, Lord. And I ask that today we might be a people who rise up and give thanks for the women among us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. We would like to honor you um, on, the, on the way out today. Uh, and it's Kind of a tradition here at the Avenue Church is uh, we'd like to give out flowers to all of our ladies today um, because we feel like uh, although this is Mother's Day and we want the moms to feel unique and special, we feel like this is also a time to honor and, and show God's appreciation and favor to all of, of all of our ladies today of any age. Uh, and so we would like for you to receive that on your way out. Uh, for all the ladies, please uh, take a flower from us and be reminded of how special you are not only to us here at the Abbey Church, but to your Heavenly Father as well. So we are um, working our way through this new series called Revive. Um, you may have uh, remembered it hopefully from last week where we uh, started Nehemiah. We began our journey through the book of uh, Nehemiah. Now just to kind of orient you guys to who Nehemiah is and uh, why that would be important uh, to you, Nehemiah, uh, for, for our sake, we, we could think of him as uh, like uh, an Israelite governor. He functioned as, as somebody who helped to govern things. He was uh, in this place called Babylonia. He'd been part of uh, a group of people who were taken exile. So uh, back in the day, if you'll travel back with me, uh, when, when Israel uh, would find themselves in disobedience, there would be times when other people, other, other nations would come in and they would, they would sort of like capture them. And there would be times when they would not only capture and overrule them, but they would then take them to the land of their own. In this case, it was Babylon. And so um, Israel had been taken captive to Babylon. But good news 
while they were in captivity, and God had promised this, that he was not going to leave them there. He was going to bring them back to Jerusalem. And so there was a guy named Ezra who went back a little bit before Nehemiah and started this like rebuilding project. Ezra kind of rebuilt the spiritual side of things. He, he rebuilt the altar and he rebuilt the temple and that sort of stuff was going on, but it was incredibly vulnerable. At that time, if you did not have a protective uh, walls and gates around you, you were in um, trouble. And so Nehemiah hears some bad news about the fact that yes, the work had started, but it was very vulnerable to attack. And, uh, and if God's people got attacked, the message was that then God was being attacked. And they were like a representative of God and, and his strength and his glory. And so Nehemiah, his heart is broken over this situation. And so he ends up going um, back. This is about 400 years before the birth of Christ, just to kind of orient you um, historically. And when Nehemiah goes back, uh, we looked last week at sort of his journey from being distant to the problem to being very near, or, or we said uh, how, how we like it to the growth of going from distant to disciple. Uh, and, and there was a couple of stops along the way that we looked at last week, and it brought us to this point, what we did is Nehemiah 1 and 2, where we got to see that Nehemiah was all in, and he was getting ready to build, and he had called some others uh, to join him in that building project. And so um, today you have an outline that may be helpful for you to follow along. Today we're gonna be talking about how uh, God's people began to collaborate for something far greater uh, than themselves. And what's really cool is we're, as, we, as we walk through this series, we're actually highlighting things that are really important to us this year. The first thing was making disciples. That was all last week. This week, it's all about collaborating and how we collaborate with other like-minded gospel-centered churches to, to see something greater happen than what we can see um, just on our own. And so uh, I, I like how there's this Nike video that my daughter and I sometimes watch. Um, when I was working through some of my schooling and trying to finish, I would actually, I was, I was writing this really super long paper and it would take me into all sorts of weird, crazy hours of the night and, and things like that. There would be this video on that I, that I would like literally play that was, um, it's called Rise and Shine. Uh, 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 and it's by Nike. And uh, so, you know, those of you who might skip onto your phone during this message, it's okay. I'm not here to judge, but that's a cool video to watch. It'll kind of like get you re-engaged into what we're doing here. Rise and shine, YouTube, Nike. And in that video, it's like three minutes of pump you up. It's like, basically, it chronicles this person's day from hearing their alarm in the morning to then what they need to do to be like the person they want to be. I love it, but there's this line in this video, it goes like this. Um, they, they've heard the alarm, and it says at the very beginning that there's a thousand reasons why they shouldn't do what they had set out to do. Have you, have you ever find yourself in that situation? You're like, man, tomorrow I'm gonna kill it in fill in the blank. And then tomorrow comes and you like start the story of why like the next tomorrow would be better than right now, right? And so this is, this is kind of what the voice says, sit up, Put your feet on the ground, don't look back, we've got work to do. That's exactly where Nehemiah finds himself. He looks around the walls, the gates, it's all a mess, man. There's like really no good news beside the fact that God had sent him and he knew that the people had work to do. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Nehemiah um, chapter 3, and we're going to be taking a look at uh, what the work entailed and how there was a point when the people of God, they were working sort of what I'm going to call in a tribal way, and then there was a shift where they moved from working sort of as like tribes or individual families to working um, together working together. And so, you know, like a lot of times we like to uh, read a commentary that goes and helps us to understand the scriptures that we're um, going to be looking at in a particular passage. Commentaries are really, really helpful. And they, they, they give you insight that you might not have, things that you might not know. So the commentary today is going to be, uh, let's see, I think I left it, but then somebody may, oh, there it is. I'm open. Good pass. Okay. The commentary today is going to be from a deep theologian you might know as LeBron James. Okay, now, here's what we're going to do. Um, basically, I'm going to ask you a question, and you're going to just shout out answers, okay? But this is really our prep work 
for the message. Okay, this is setting the context for you so that we have a really good understanding before we get head into the scriptures. Now, um, we all know who LeBron James is, correct? If not, then this would be a time for you to get your phone out. <laughs> um, LeBron James, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's 3.30 tip today. Um, the Cavs will be playing, who will they be playing? Okay, they're going to be playing the Celtics, all right? Um, any, any Cavalier fans in here today? Any, any Celtic fans in here today? Okay, all right. Any Heat fans that, like, anybody not care about the NBA? I don't see this. Okay, bad example. Anyway, no, I'm, I'm so going to say. I'm open again. All right, LeBron James. There are times, there are times when LeBron is doing his thing and he is playing what I would call like very, um, somebody, are you open now? Very tribal, okay? And so what that means is he's passing, but really what he, what he wants is he wants the ball back. Like, he's like, I kind of need you, but I need you to, to, to like do what I want to do. So I'm, I'm a little bit, we might call that using you, but I'm Ron James. So, you know, like I'm Ron Ron, and this is what I do sometimes. I go tribal, I play tribal. And, and I like, I, I need the rest of you. I can't play one on five, you know, I, I can't. But I don't really like play with you. I sort of play next to you. And then there's times when LeBron, he plays a different type of basketball. And, and, and uh, when, when he plays this other type of basketball, that type of basketball, man, that's called together basketball. We wouldn't call that tribal, we call that together. And in together basketball, what we see here, oh man, twice with an open cup, look at those hands. That's amazing. In together basketball, he's actually playing with his team. He's actually not only including them to get to his own stated purpose, but he's like, um, he, they're like functioning as one. They're playing together, so he's actually giving the ball away so that they can do what they're uniquely gifted and called to do. And together they're moving forward. Sometimes it's all about LeBron, and sometimes it's LeBron making those people around him better so that they can move forward together. You're going to see today, that's our context, you're going to see today there was a time when God's people were playing like next to each other. And it was, it was pretty good, it was pretty significant. But then there was something that shifted. And they started playing as one. They started playing with, instead of just next to. And something really amazing happened when that, when that became the reality. Nehemiah 3 gives us that context, and it says that there's all these um, different families and, and um, tribes, if you will, that are part of what God is doing back in Jerusalem. And um, interesting fact, I don't know if, if you know like, how many of the Jewish people went back and were a part of this rebuilding project, but it was about 2%. About 2% of the nation of Israel went back to be a part of this rebuilding project. It's really cool when you think about how God always uses the remnant. God's really into small numbers, not big numbers. God's into the margins, and he's into using things and people that are oftentimes um, unexpected. And so he does the same thing here um, in, in this particular portion of Scripture. Is about 2% of the people go back, and he does this amazing uh, rebuilding project. The book of Nehemiah, if you're not familiar with it, if you have a Bible, um, it's, it's sort of just like right before, not too, not too long before Psalms, if you know where Psalms is. It's a little bit closer toward the front end of your Bible. Um, somewhere in the middle there, if, if not again, your phone comes in handy here. Google it and, and, and get with me. I'm in Nehemiah 3, verses 1 through 5. We're going to be talking about what it means um, to, to sort of be tribal at the beginning. I'm going to say some names that sound really weird. I'm not sure this is how you say these names. Let's just be, let's just be real with each other. But I'm going to say them like I know them, okay? Does that make sense? So if you ever read this to one of your friends, just say it like you know it. Because they probably don't unless they're like John O'Brien, and then he'll quietly, lovingly correct you. All right. Then Elie Shep. <laughs> 
the high priest rose up with the brothers, the priests, and they built the Sheep Gate. They consecrated it and set its doors. They consecrated it as far as the Tower of the Hundred and as far as, uh, uh, as the Tower of Hananel. And next to him, the men of Jericho built. And next to them, Zakur, the son of Inri built. I'm not, I'm, it's, it's not coming out good, is it? <laughs> it's, not, it's not as confident as I want it to sound. The sons of Hasaniah built the fish gate. They laid its beams and set its doors, its bolts and its bars. And next to them, Miramoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hazadak, repaired. And next to them, Meshus. Ah, I just fumbled that one from the beginning. And next to them, thank you, Meshulam. Yeah, if you know it, just say it out with me. And next to them, the son of Barakai, son of, mm. Jeff Rose, I can see you laughing at me right now. Mesh has a bell, repaired. And next to them, Zaduk, I got that one. The son of Bana, repaired. And next to them, the Dekoites repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve the Lord. Interesting, that's a whole other message, by the way on the nobles. If you are like not super familiar with the scripture and and you feel more comfortable now because your pastor sounded a little bit like he doesn't know much about these scriptures, welcome, welcome. <laughs> and next to, and next to, and next to. Now this is a really cool moment in Israel history. Like, so I don't want to, I don't want to play it down. Like, I don't want to try to cast a negative light on it. Right? I'm just trying to give you um, a little bit of a greater glimpse of something more that 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 was happening. So it's cool. They're they're getting after the work. If you look at chapter three and and just maybe just do this as homework. Uh, read through chapter three sometime today after you've cooked and cleaned and done all that really cool stuff for mom. After you like really pampered her, read chapter three. Don't read it next to her because it's it's not like. Read chapter four maybe for her. But but go home. Read chapter three and just circle all the next twos. And you're going to see that that kind of like defines this passage. This. These people built next to these people, which built next to these people. And so here's what they were doing. They were trying to build back the walls, repair the gates, so that the outside enemies would not be able to come in and bring shame to the name of God. Next to, next to, next to. It kind of, um, th that's kind of how we define tribal, is that each tribe, each family, each sort of like unit, they were doing really good work and they were doing it right next to another tribe or another family doing really good work. So I'm doing my work and you're doing your work and we're, we're next to each other. And we're really focused and we're really into what we're doing, but we're really next to each other, like shoulder to shoulder. It's not bad. I want to look at something maybe a little bit better. Being together. Being together. Now, in order for these people to, to come together, well, they, they actually needed something. Um, they needed some help. They needed some help. And they got it in the form of a gift that many of us might not think is very gift worthy. We're going to call it today the gift of desperation. They were given the gift of desperation. You see, it was only when things got difficult and things started to break down and there started to be some pressure that could compromise the whole thing that they actually were forced to start working together and not just next to. Check this out in verse 2 of chapter 4. Here's, uh, here's what we got going on. So this guy named uh, Sam Ballet, he comes and he starts, he starts uh, kind of opposing the work verbally. And he, he's got some force behind him. He's not just any guy. He's, he's got a, a bit of authority. He's not happy that the walls are going up. He actually liked it when God's people were super vulnerable and, and not really a thing. That's, that's how he preferred it. When, when God's people were, were either, uh, they, they were just kind of like, um, they weren't relevant because they were 
they were unprotected. There was there was really nothing unique and different and special going on. That's kind of how Sam Sam Bolette liked it. Um, so it says here in the beginning of chapter four that he was angry and he was enraged and he jeered at the Jews. And in verse two, and, and here's what he says. And, and he said, in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, okay, so he's got a little, maybe he's got a little force there. What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it, the wall, the gates, for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Will they revive the stones? It gets going a little bit more in chapter 4 where uh, there, there's a little bit more. If you, if you look even in, in verse 5, he gets angry. In verse 8, it says that, that they plotted together to come and fight and cause confusion. So this isn't a guy that's just talking some smack. He's actually um, plotting some stuff to come and bring destruction to it. So he's, he's this annoying voice over here that actually has some authority and is gaining some ground uh, on what he's going to do. And, and what he's going to do is he's going to come and he's going to battle against them. And, you know, he may destroy it, he may not, but at least he's going to cause confusion. He's going to bring confusion to their mission. It's, um, it's, a, it's a pretty scary predicament that gets people find themselves in. They were, they were back, they were doing God's thing, they were about the work, which was work, man, like putting the wall back up. Think about the materials. How did they get materials? How did they move materials? How did they bring heavy like equipment and stones to places that would be able to withstand an attack? I mean, it's not easy work, right? But they were doing it. And you would think that would be enough. Now they gotta deal with this guy. Now this guy's mounting an army. Now this guy's like a serious threat, not only to the mission, but to them personally. Well, 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 now, well now what are God's people going to do? The gift of desperation brings them to a point of actually beginning to collaborate, beginning to work together. Let's check out some of the verses that point to that. Um, my favorite one, which is kind of where we we're camping out today is in verse 14. There's some supporting ones that I'll point out to you. But 14, look at what it says. Nehemiah, he can tell that like fear's kind of setting in. He can he, he gets a sense that that his people are starting to become more aware of the enemy than their God. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been more aware of your enemy than your God? Have you ever been more aware of sort of the waves and the wind? Like like over your Jesus? Your situation is like super great and your God is kind of like medium size. Well, that's where, that's where these people, if you walk through anxiety, if that's kind of part of your reality, this is your world. This is your world. The Lord spoke this beautifully, beautifully to me last night. Here's what he said right out of his word. Do not be afraid of them. Do not be afraid of them. Well, how's that going to happen? I mean, if you seriously deal with any kind of anxiousness, you know, this month is Mental Health, Mental Health Awareness Month. Did you know that? And did you know that I had a friend I was talking to this week who said the church seems to be like one of the worst places for people who struggle with mental health illness? Because we just kind of think it's going to go away. We just kind of Say, pray it away, read these three verses and call me in the morning. It should be better. And check this out, it's not, is it? It doesn't just get better, does it? Because that's not how God deals with those sort of things. I mean, look at how God deals with a real and crippling fear. He says, do not be afraid of them, but that's not where he stops. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. He brings them back to himself. He's like, look, man, you're not going to be able to do this. You are so limited. You are not where 
your faith should be. Remember me. Remember my greatness. Remember who I have always been and who I promise to be. Turn your eyes to me. Although it feels like death, keep them on me. And then go fight. And then go battle. And then do the work. Work the steps. Get the help you need. Day in and day out, the scripture says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. The next two words we cannot forget and fight. There's a responsibility to God's people when it comes upon them to not only remember the word of God, but then in great confidence because of who God is to keep going and to fight for what they know is theirs. I love that because the scriptures, they never downplay stuff. They never say, oh, you know, no bigs, like God's got you. All you have to do is remember it and it all goes away. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. And then we're going to see in this passage, slap a sword on you and go out there and battle your enemy. It doesn't just happen. We are involved. God's people are called to fight, remembering their strength and their redeemer. Can God, could God have immediately dismissed Sambalet and the enemies? Yes. Can God immediately take something away from us? Yes. But time after time after time after time, you know how he does it? Watch this. You know how he does it? He does it when we get vulnerable and we get together. And then he does his best work in community, not with you isolated over there praying for some sort of deliverance and not inviting anybody toward it. That's what he does here with his people. He's like, hey, now, now you're going to get together, and now I'm going to show up in a really amazing way like you've never seen. Ready? Well, how do I know? How do, what were some of the signs that they got together? Check this out. Verse 9, it said they prayed together. Verse 9, it said they set a guard together. Verse 10, this one tribe is like, look, they looked at the work, and they're like, we can't do it. Like, we're not going to be able to do it. That's the greatest sin. That's one of the most Christian things you can ever say, by the way. I can't do this. Yes! Well, amazing! Amen! Let's bring the worship team out and sing to that. That is the anthem of the Christian man. Like, I, I, I just, I can't do this. Of course you can. That's why God gave you his spirit to surrender to him. And as God fills you up, you begin to have power and potential that you never realized you had. I can't do this, but God in me can. God in me will. God in me loves to do that sort of stuff. So let's get better at learning how to say, I can't do this, and what does it mean to allow God to do it? Rather than sort of like trying to white knuckle whatever it is our situation might be. Verse 13, it said that they stationed clans in the lowest part of the wall. Okay, so there was some strategy to them collaborating. They didn't just like start fighting aimlessly. They really thought about it. They got some tools and some equipment Verse 14, they got empowered together. They came together. They did not forsake the gathering of people coming together. There's something important that happens on Sunday morning that you can't get like really anywhere else. When God's people gather, you can listen to better preaching, hear awesome worship. You can do all that stuff from your phone. But when God's people come together, there's something like really special and powerful. It's like an experience. Well, that, that's we're starting to see that now. Verse 14, verse 15. It said that they all returned to work on the wall, but now watch this, they're really collaborating. How do I know? Because half of them were working on the wall, doing wall stuff, and half of them were protecting those who were working. Check this out. They weren't working next to each other anymore. That didn't define them anymore. It wasn't like, how's your work going? It's okay, it's okay. You know, TGIF, happy Friday to you, happy, oh look, I'm a little bit, they weren't, it wasn't like that. It was like, okay, I'm gonna work, and right behind you, like, I'm, I'm right, I'm, dude, I'm right there, okay? I'm, I'm right there. You do your work, and, well, so they didn't have that, but, like, sorry. Yeah. I'm right, I'm right behind you, bro. I got you. I've got 
you. You do you, I'm going to do me, but together we're going to survive this. They didn't send anybody out on their own. It was like your life depends on me and vice versa. My life depends on you. They were actually working together, no longer just next to each other. You wondered how I was going to get down, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't sure going all the way up was a good idea when I got up there. Um, not sure it would be a good idea to do it yet. Verse 20, they had a place to rally together when things got bad, where God said would fight for them. Verse 21, they labored. It says we labored. Verse 22 and verse 23, we slept in Jerusalem with our clothes on. We slept in Jerusalem with our clothes on because they always needed to be ready to go. They were that committed to one another and to the mission of God. And so what I want to do in our time remaining is just kind of look at the difference between tribal and together. Tribal and together. Um, there's a couple of things that we're going to work through there on your outline. You, one or two of them may sort of pop out to you, and, and, and I think that would be important to listen to what God's saying to you. Um, there's this organization called uh, Church United. I don't know exactly how many churches are involved at this point. It's, it's over 50, and, it's, and it's, um, it's happening in South Florida, and it's somewhat of a phenomenon. Like, people outside of South Florida are coming to kind of check out Church United. We are one of the churches that is a part of this Church United movement. And basically, what Church United says is we're better together. Church United is, is all about Nehemiah 4, not Nehemiah 3. And, um, you know, what I love about Church United is um, there's a tangible expression that is left when the church unites in this way. How do I know? January 6, 2017, right next to baggage claim terminal number two at 12.53 p.m., mass shooting in the Fort Lauderdale airport. Five people were left killed. 54 people were hospitalized. Church United issued a letter expressing their sorrow and their desire to basically be with these people in their pain. But they realized that a letter like just wouldn't do it in this case. And so they went beyond that. And basically they decided to take up a special offering amongst all of their Church United churches. And what they said was, like, here's what we're going to do. As a church, we're going we're to enter into this dark space with some light. We can't bring these five people back. We can't, we can't undo what's been done. But when the kingdom of God comes, it always makes things better. It always pushes back the enemy, whatever and whoever the enemy is. And so here's what Church United says, we're going to pay for all the out-of-pocket hospital expenses for all 54 people who were hospitalized because of the shooting. And that is exactly 100% what they did. And so they were able to talk with um, Broward Medical and arrange for every single cent of every person's bill to be covered completely by, check this out, the church. Not one church, not three churches, but the church covered it all. You see, that's what happens when God's people decide to quit working next to each other and start working with one another. Like crazy stuff that cannot be explained by an on-watching world happens when the church starts to collaborate and be together rather than just simply working next to one another in our prescribed tribes. Well, let's check out some of the specifics of, of how this works out for us and, and then maybe where this touches ground for you. And so just working through the list, when we think of tribal, and this comes from the passage, if you look at the passage, you see where these implications come from. When, when Israel was, God's people, when, when they were working in, in tribes, they were working next to one another. And then, and then when, when the gift of desperation came, it forced them to work with one another. Israel, for a while, uh, assumedly, 
prayed for one another. But in this passage, it seems like for the first time, we see them actually pray with one another. Check the difference there. I know it might be subtle. Hey, hey, I prayed for you yesterday. That's awesome. Verse, hey, would it be cool if I just prayed for you right now and we prayed together? It's a different dynamic, is it not? Hey, do you know if you have, if you've ever had anybody pray for you? Be like, oh, you're, I'm going to pray for you. That's sweet, dude. I said the Christian thing. I'll, maybe I'll remember. And like, you go do your thing, and I'll go do my thing. Verse, are you, I'm listening. Is it cool if I just like? Is it cool if we just prayed right now? I just prayed for you. Like we prayed together. Tribal prays for, together prays with. Tribal strategizes for certain things. Together strategizes with. We see this with the Church United example I gave. We can have a strategy for the Avenue Church and Calvary Chapel can have a strategy for Calvary Chapel and Redemption Church can have a strategy for Redemption Church. But until we start coming together and strategizing with one another, we're probably not going to see the ball move up the field that much as it pertains to the gospel movement in South Florida. I was thinking through some of these things next to and with do you know for seven years, we have worked next to Trinity Church in school? Right down the road. They're about, I don't know, maybe three miles from here. It's a good, it's a really cool place. Really cool people. We're, we got some cool people here. And we've both been doing a really good work right next to one another. But as of late, we've begun to explore what does it look like for us to start doing work with one another. It's one of the reasons we moved our offices there. It's one of the reasons you're going to see us saying, hey, what about this event? What about this? What about this opportunity where we might be able, rather than offering something next to another local church, we might start to be able to offer something with another local church. We just believe it tells a greater story because we're seeing that happen in Scripture over and over again. Tribal embraces a small vision. Tribal is all about like maintaining what you have. How can we maintain and not lose people? Together embraces a big vision. Like, like they think about more. They think about, hey, what if we started to measure how well we're doing based on how well the city of Delray Beach is doing? Like, what's, what's going on in, in crime rate? What's going on with the reading level? What's going on in addiction? How about, how about foster families? What if we started using metrics that were not just about how do we maintain our own budget, but how do we see the city of Delray Beach flourish and even beyond? Well, if we actually had that kind of metric, then we would realize very quickly, like Judah did in this chapter, oh, we can't do it alone. What is little baby, bitty Adam Church? Just a little baby Adam Church right down the road, seven years old, just trying to meet, you know, at you know, Atlantic School. We can't do it alone. We can't handle everything I do. And I only mentioned like three or four things. I didn't mention commerce. I didn't mention the elderly. I didn't mention the homeless. Like, what if we started saying, hey, like the city of Delray Beach is our responsibility, and as they flourish, so too do we. That's how we're going to start measuring how well we're doing. Somebody says, how's your church doing? The first thing I think of is like, oh, well, you know, um, you know had budget, or how many people were there on Sunday, or how many people were in groups, or this or that. What if that narrative started to change, and I started to think, you know what? Man, third graders have seen a 5% increase on, on rating, reading at grade, grade level. And I know what that means for their future. We're doing fantastic. Like, we, we, we couldn't do that alone, right? Because here's the deal. We do two things. We do two things here at the Avenue Journal. We do, we do a bunch of things. But we're like, we try to own two areas. We try to own sort of the adoption, foster care, like widow and orphan area, and, and we, try to, we try to service the addiction area. We, we try to do sort of those two things as, as some of our outreach and stuff like that. And what that means is we can't get to all the people who need help with reading, and we can't get to all the homeless, and we can't get... We can't do this on our own. We can't do this on our own. Tribal loves being unique. Together loves being uniquely used. Tribal loves being unique. People who are in the tribe, man, they love to think about their distinctives. They're like, this is what we believe and this is who we are. Bam. How do you like that? 
together is like, yeah, we've got some distinctives, but I'm more into how can we be used uniquely in the city with others, not just how can we be different. Tribal thinks conceptually, like, I think this would be good, I think this would be good, it makes for good, like, stickers and t-shirts. Together thinks ownership, owning the brokenness and the lostness, specifically of certain areas. Tribal is defined by territory, like, this is mine, like, we got this here, like, in a weird kind of possessive way. Together is defined by parish. It's like the one church model. You know, back in the day, there would be, like, a parish, and there, there would be, like, a parish for the city. And the pastors would consider themselves pastors of the city, pastors of the parish, not just pastors over here, pastors over here. We need to start thinking of ourselves as pastors of the city and not just members of the Avenue Church. Tribal plans for meetings to give explanations on things. Together plans for war. Like they know there's an experience coming. They know what's at stake. They know there's an enemy who hates what they're doing. And so when they get together, they know this is about more like warfare rather than just like, hey, what's the nice cute strategy that we could or couldn't do? Tribal rests in tribe. Together rests in relationship. Got to experience this in a really cool way as I sat in Pastor Vince's office, <coughs> praying for the guys over there, Trinity, them praying for me. It's like relationship, building relationship. Not about <coughs> distinctives, more about relationship. Working through this point in the message, and it's like, well, why though? Like, why would we do that? <coughs> it's just easier to build here, our little sandcastle, than to think about taking on the ocean. It's more manageable that way. And I think, man, have you ever been in one of those situations where you got in trouble and it was really awesome to have somebody else to blame? <laughs> I mean, that's, I, that's one of the reasons, not the only one, but it's gotta be one of the reasons God gave siblings. Especially younger ones who can't speak up for themselves, right? Like, so if you're about six, seven years older, perfect. You know, you're eight, they're two, amazing. It's like, my sister made me do it, and she's like, you know, just crying and doing her thing. She can't explain. And so you have that built-in alibi, right? You've got that built-in, like, well, this person made me do it. And I started thinking about, like, some of the moves that we're making as a church and this Church United thing and how we're gathering with other churches and how we're trying to build relationships and, and sort of forge some new ground with some new friends. And it's really clear to me that the gospel made us do it. Like, the gospel makes you do this. You, we don't make ourselves do it. The nature of the gospel is that walls actually come down so that unity can thrive. Amen. John 17 and Ephesians 2, they're really clear about this. John 17, Jesus is praying so that, that we might be one so that the world would know. And Ephesians 2 talks about, like, hey, like, you guys who were far off and us who were near, now that's all gone, and, and we're, like, we're like one, we're like one family. You see, when Christ went to the cross, it wasn't just about you. Listen, we share the gospel every week here, primarily. And, the, and the, what you can do is at times you can truncate the gospel to think it's about just you. Jesus did die for your personal sin. Outside of his sacrifice, and you're receiving it by faith, you have no hope with a holy and righteous God. That's true. His death and resurrection had your name on it. And it purchases your forgiveness and your cleanliness and your righteousness. You receive it by turning from yourself in sin and trusting in Jesus' finished work. Saying, he's my Messiah, he's my one, he's my life. I, I quit. Let you begin. And a lot of times I share the gospel actually that way. And when I share it that way, it's not wrong. It's just a little short. It's a little truncated because at, at that moment, you can think that the gospel is all about you and your personal forgiveness of sin. The gospel's not less than that, but it's actually so much more. The gospel is about how God created this new, beautiful, and diverse family where the walls come down from every race and religion and tribe and family, and we get to be united not by our blood type, but by the blood of Jesus. He's the one who takes us from far off 
to brother, to sister, to friend. So the gospel, the death and resurrection of Christ allows for you to be forgiven of sin, but it also allows for you to pursue these incredibly dynamic and collaborative relationships that we now call family with believers around the world. No matter what they think about baptism, no matter what they think about this particular brand of theology or that brand of theology, if they are believers who are looking to Christ and Christ alone as their only hope, then they are brothers and sisters. And the gospel implores us to start acting like that. The gospel makes us do it. So as we think about where we take that this week, it's Mother's Day. Y'all know that, right? Don't take the flower from the Advent Church and say it's from you. That's, I've already like called you out. <laughs> you got to do your own work. But I was thinking about moms, especially the, the mom in my house, who's my beautiful wife. And if you want to ask her like how she's doing, a lot of times that starts in her home. Like the condition, I'm, like the literal condition of our home oftentimes will affect kind of how she's doing, just how she's made. And my wife and I have had some pretty serious uh, discussion -ish about whether the home's a disaster or not. Man, this home is a disaster. I'm like, what are you talking about? You can see the floor. It's okay. She's like, no, we got this, we got that. Here's the, here's the deal. It's always a good place to start with your home. You want to see the church united and see God revive the church as like one church? He's not going to do that out there unless he actually does it first at your home. So let me just end by asking you these questions as we go. Are you living more tribal or more together in your closest relationships? Are you working next to your spouse? Or are you working with your spouse? Do you know more of what your spouse's shoulder looks like or more of what her face looks like? Is she your partner or is she like your, your person? How often are you praying with your family and not just for your family? You embracing a small vision of how you're gonna get through the week? Or are you thinking about how you're going to send your children out as arrows to pierce the darkness with the gospel? You really enjoy being unique? Or do you enjoy being uniquely used in your family? You got a territory that you're protecting? Like, you don't get this, babe. Or is your home more of like a parish? We got to figure this out together. And I'm in 100%, no matter what percent you're in. You guys planning for meetings? Or do you realize it's like a war for your family? Have you come to that realization that there's a Sambalat enemy out there who's like, what do you think you're going to do with your family? You think you're going to raise up three, four, one kid that actually loves Jesus and goes out there and changes the world? You think you're going to do that, man? You can't even get through Tuesday. You think you're going to have a marriage that flourishes? You think there's going to be something beautiful that happens in this home? Listen, if you don't understand that it's war for your family, then you're never going to act accordingly. You'll remain in tribe. And together with you, just something you hear about when people preach John 17. So I encourage you today as we call our team out and close the song, that you would think through that list. I've given it to you in the outline. 
that you would actually maybe talk with your closest relationships and say, hey, let's circle one or two of these and actually move together. <laughs> because we've been traveling to you. Amen? Amen. Father, we pray as we turn to you, we begin uh, our weeks today on Mother's Day. Lord, we pray that you would begin with us in this idea of moving from tribal to together, that you would make our homes not separate tribes where we all have our unique space and talents, but where you would actually make us a family, where we work with one another. And our desire is to bring the best out of those that we call spouse, son, daughter. Help us, Lord, in these things. Begin in our own hearts so that when we talk about this as a church, we've actually seen it become a reality in our own hearts. May this be the gift that we give to you because you first gave to us. We love you. And we believe these things as we sing about our resurrection hope. Jesus. Amen.